We're here. Hi. Hey, Hi, everybody. Otter Dome. Man. How are we together? So this is the first time we had a little buggy things happen this morning. That was yeah. fun. <laughs> Arsham had a little trouble with his internet. Google decided to delete some of our stuff. But it's good. We're here. It's all good. Good day to everyone, wherever you're tuning in. Um, thank you so much for being here. I appreciate you. Uh, how was your day, Artem? It was rainy all day long. Oh, no. Almost. Oh, man. Yeah, and, I, and I'm dirty as a pig. <laughs> <laughs> My clothes, on each one I'm working with dogs. Because they've been dirty as pigs. <laughs> <laughs> oh man all right so let's jump into this um so thank you everybody for tuning in last week thank you for your comments and questions as always that means the world to us um, i know this is an interesting topic uh, mentally because for us it's um we've been there i mean we've had the the like wait what's he saying like wait hold on huh how could that be wait huh so um so we wanted to that's why we wanted to make this a two-part series so if there's anything that we talked about last week, by all means, drop a comment um, in Facebook and let us know if there was something in particular that was um, either eye-opening or you guys are idiots, please explain this to me. You know, any of that stuff works for us. We're fine. So, um, yeah, I, I, uh, I saw a couple interesting quotes and... Um, from this week, and I thought this one was an interesting one. Play is a brain's favorite way of learning. And I, I think a lot of people, when they play uh, games with their dogs, animals, they or, um, I, slow down for a second. When people play games with their dogs, Artem, they don't think they're teaching them anything. Yeah, most people think that they're just having fun. Mm hmm but there is an educational component that's there, there is a pro problem in there is a problem in, in general because every time we communicating dogs learning something about us and from us yeah and especially when it's uh, happening with a lot of emotions yeah and this is how usually those games that people play with dogs uh, have that component of a lot of emotions. Yeah, and I feel like this is a very, I mean, it's few of these. I just, every week I go and I Google kind of like our topic and just try to find some quotes, and I thought this was another one. You can't, you have to accept the fact that things don't go the way you hope, and I think that's another big piece of this. You know, we hope that the dog is learning one type of lesson, but unfortunately, as a lot of us who are willing to, um, to look at the bigger picture, what we hope isn't, you know, our best intentions isn't what a dog is being judged for. It's their predatory behavior because predatory behavior is what gets every single dog in trouble. Every single dog gets in trouble for some type of predatory behavior. Um, so where are they learning yeah, from? Yeah. Let, let me add something. We talk about pet dogs, not walking dogs, not hunting yes. dogs. Yeah. Pet dogs. Yeah. Um, and the one that I just love, the greatest distance between two individuals is misunderstanding. And that's why I think we're... Yeah, we're gonna... that, that's one was mind-blowing. Yeah, because yeah, that's all that's happening. Um, so I'm going to poke yeah. around a little bit today. Like we said, Google all, all of a sudden just kind of like disappeared some of our stuff. So the beginning is a little bit choppy. I had spent all night and all morning kind of fine-tuning it now. Um, and, and I deleted it in one second. Eh, it wasn't you. It was Google. Let's blame <laughs> Google. They're the problems for all our stuff going on in our world. It's not you, Artem. You're perfect. That's just yeah, Angelina. Yeah, I tried to, to copy it and then some part of it just <laughs> disappeared. Yeah. So um, I figured we would talk. And, and so let me, let me just go through. This is one of the things that's um, missing here is the resources that we're using here are number one, Artem's experience and my experience. Our observations, 
And most importantly, a lot of what Brandon talks about, Brandon Fouché, um, we put in the comments last week a video. I went, re went and re um, watched it again today. I went back and watched it. And every time I watch it, there's something else that I'll focus on. So uh, yeah. I, we'll definitely put that video back in the comments. It's an hour long, the video, but we start right there at minute five where he starts talking about toys. So we're going to talk about some of those, but by all means, go do your own research. That's the most important thing is to go do it yourself. Don't take what I say. Don't take what Artem says. There's no truth in belief. There's no um, truth in beliefs. You have to do your own research and find out for yourself what what your experience, you know, the outcome from that experience. So, one of the things um, I figured we would talk about is how the dogs actually get confused. And one of the things Brandon talks about is why does hunting exist? And hunting exists, and the purpose of hunting is to fulfill hunger. And how do dogs use that with their mouth? And as far as I know, um, I don't think nature creates a mouth for anything else. Maybe grooming, pulling stuff out of fur, but the mouth is to talk to the stomach. Would you agree, or is there anything else, Artem? I mean, I know. And it's the same for us. It's, yeah. it's not a question at all. Yeah. And especially when we're talking about predators. This is how they get their food, not yeah. only how they eat eat that food. And think about it. When you were in second grade and you bit the, the girl when you had a little crush on her and you bit her, did you get in trouble for that? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. You don't, you don't bite your friends, right? Or your friends' friends. Yeah, yeah, so. yeah. Um, and what he talks about here is how the confusion happens is you play the games and the dog the whole time is trying to figure out how does this make sense to my life? How does this skill go into my life daily when I don't, yeah. I don't need to hunt anymore. My food comes in a bowl. Why are we doing this activity? And remember, it doesn't matter how we intellectualize it. It only, we have to respect that it only makes sense to a dog in a dog way. So how, how are they supposed to understand that if they don't have that ability to? So you're going you're gonna to say something? No. Okay. So go, go. One, one of the things that I thought was interesting was, you know, we talked about the history. Toys were used to create working dogs. They were used yep. to create prey drive to create working dogs. And the problem is 99% of the people that we bump into every single day don't have working dogs anymore. And again, all predatory behaviors get dogs in trouble. So why are... Why, I guess this would be a question for you, Artem, or maybe, I don't know, just a general rhetorical question. Is, so why are we using predatory games to train animals for a skill set that we don't need anymore? We don't need hunters. There is a lot of reasons, but the uh, main reason is that people don't know what's really happening. That's all. Yeah. Main reason. Yeah. Second reason, people know what's happening and they decide, like... Um, that they know better? I still will be doing, yeah, yeah. I, I, I know better or no, it will not happen to me and my dog mm -hmm. and all of that stuff. Yeah. And, and it, this yes, is... This is two, two main reasons. So one of the things we have to remember is this is something Brandon says and I, I love this quote. Dogs are the only animal on this planet right now who get killed for doing what they were supposed to be do, to, intended to do, which is to hunt. No other animal on this planet gets killed for that, except for dogs. Your dog kills the yeah. neighbor's cat, it's your dog's fault. The dog kills your neighbor's bird, it's the dog's fault. So we have to be aware if we don't need this skill anymore, why are we doing it? And today we're going to talk about the, from the patterns that I've seen, you've seen, we've observed, what, um, sorry, somebody wrote, Artem looks much more lively this time. 
That's why we're starting it an hour early because it's late there, man. Starting this at <laughs> 10 p.m. is a. It's that. I mean, believe me, I, at 10 p.m. I couldn't imagine doing this week after week. But you know, so if our dogs are the only one, we're playing. We're playing a gamble with their life by saying that we know more. And um, so I think we should just kind of jump into it. And we're going to go through the list uh, that we, we covered last episode of the games, the common games that people play, and from our experiences, how that could lead to the misbehavior that we're f- experiencing um, in this dog-human relationship. So the number one thing we're going to talk about, starting it off, is chasing our dogs. The, oh, you ready? You ready? Let's go. Let's go. Right? And, and the you move, I move, let's chase. Let's create excitement. I want you to ask yourself, when we go through these particulars, can you honestly say, I play that game and my dog has that behavior? So that's, that's the truth. And I'm not saying you're right or wrong. We're not placing blame. We're just saying... Could this problem that I'm suffering from be the cause of, or be the effect from this game? Could the cause be the effect? Does your dog run away from you off leash? So Artem, you see this a lot. A person approaches their dog and what does the dog do? Run away. Yep. Because they know, already know, when that moment's happening, they already know from previous experience that they faster that they in generally can manipulate humans in that way because this is what they learned from that game and it's actually it's nothing like it's not uh, the the thing about all of that all of that games it's if uh, especially for people who are listening to that information for the first time it's so actually simple like it's in front of our face nose it's like one competing with another try to get me try to get me no no i'll try to it's it's competition actually so then why dogs cannot use use that knowledge because they have it already while uh, when you um let him be off leash and then he trying to eat some some stuff that she, the dog should not eat and <laughs> you're trying to stop the dog or at least uh, come towards the dog and take it back from his mouth. Yeah. So why that dog should not run away? Yeah. We're expecting- because he successfully did, did, did that many times mm-hmm. and we asked them to do this. And we're expect- and it's competition. And we're expecting them to understand the difference. Right now, because there's a street and a car coming, when I come towards you, I don't want you to run away. But then when we did it in yeah. the same spot last week and there wasn't a car yeah. coming and there wasn't yeah. danger, yeah. there wasn't a liability, now I want you to see the difference. And then we get angry, yeah. we get more panicked, which then makes the dog want to stay away from us even more. And this is something, again, that Brandon says that I love. And I'm a firsthand experience of the, this... My dogs, and he always says this, my dogs have no idea how fast I am. They have no yeah, idea that they're if, faster than yeah. me. And if you think about it, it's so unnatural in hierarchy for a leader to pr- approach a subordinate and the subordinate to walk away. It does not happen in nature. So you're actually exacerbating a problem that the dog wouldn't have. When you approach your dog as a leader, they should get still and say what's the problem here just like in the video i'm going to pull it up maybe i'll play it in the video um, that i had from a while ago when jake went into the room and the two dogs were playing everybody got still because somebody that was above them in the pack approached and that's not a time to run away because if you run away then you're causing more of a problem so then you will get disciplined so it can actually if we think about it logically, you're actually doing something that is completely unnatural to a dog, to all of nature, to run away from a leader. And if you want to do that, then get the hell out of here. I mean, how many times do you have to chase your kid down the stairs to get them to listen to you? Or do when you talk to your kid, do you expect them to pay attention? 
You expect them to pay attention. I don't want to have to chase you into another. If my kid knows that he can walk away to avoid my discipline, <laughs> it just doesn't make sense. But yet we teach our dogs to do this, which is kind of interesting. So if you have, if you play chase and you struggle with off-leash stuff, these two things, in my experience, are related. They are absolutely related that your dog should not know how much faster they are. Because if my dog is eating something and I run at them, they stop. They're like, oh, geez, what's up? Um, anything else you want to add there, Artem? No. Okay. Um, so now we just figured that one would be a, a quick one. Um, yeah. Throwing objects, sticks, toys. We're going to get into specifics, like, you know, some things like stuffed animals and, and, and particulars. But just generally throwing objects, what this can lead to. Um, and I'm just going to read these. I went through and watched all. Yeah. Uh, I, went, I went through. I'm just going to tell everybody. I went through and watched all seven of these videos to add subtitles. And I realized how much more I talk than Artem. And it's, and it's because I had the Google Doc in front of me. So I'm trying not to. I'm like super self-conscious this week. I mean, like, you know, <laughs> I've been sending Artem all the videos just saying, like, I talk too much. But it's hard because I'm the one looking at it. So I, I'm trying to say it and then I'm going to have Artem respond. So I am conscious of how much I'm talking, just so we know. Um, so I'm okay with that. I know. <laughs> <laughs> and if we were doing this in Russian, I would be the same way. Throwing objects and what that can lead to. So some of the things, Artem, pulling on leash. Think about it. When you throw something, you're teaching your dog. Artem, when I throw something, what is my dog learning? Where is the best place to be? For the dog. Yeah. Around me. That should be. But when I throw yeah, something, what am I teaching them? Ah, the best place somewhere else far somewhere from me. Somewhere else is the best place are, to be. Uh, yeah, yeah, best place, yeah. So when my dog is And out, actually being there being reward because they get there, did something and fulfill that like uh, accomplish the task, yeah, finish the, the uh, reach to the goal, yeah, things like that. So every time I throw an object, can we see how that could then translate to pulling on a leash? Could we see how it could translate to hunting on the walk? Could we see how the, the forehead gets wrinkled? If we look at, remember, the predatory sequence, the first thing to do is orientate the movement, which is eyes. We could see how the breathing gets intensified because I'm increasing, right? I'm intensing and getting myself more intense. I'm getting more, yes, I'm searching and hunting in the environment. What the dog is thinking is, what can I put pressure on? So what we're teaching yeah. our dogs, and this is not every single dog. You might be sitting here lucky enough to have that one simple dog. I have that one dog. That you could do all of these things wrong and you will still be rewarded with an amazing dog. It might still be bold. It might still climb on a person's lap. It might still do things that are bold, but it might never be aggressive. She's never going to ignore nature to do something like this, to go out to a stimulant. So we're teaching the animal to go after a stimulant. Do you see something out there that's important to you? Go towards it. Every single time we throw a ball, every time we throw an object, it can cause miscommunications yeah. with another dog. So you take your dog. This, is, this drives me crazy. I'm not going to get fired up. But every time we go to a dog park at Dog Beach, you see somebody bring a tennis ball, bring a stick. Why are you bringing your dog in a place to socialize with other animals and then having them do a predatory activity that's not for socialization? So now my dog is like, whoa, that's weird, right? And I'm not saying my dog because my dog would look at that. Hopefully, I'm in my, what I'm trying to educate them and say is like, whoa, that's weird. That's intense. I'm going to stay away from that. I'm not going to go towards what's stimulating me. I'm going to be able to assess that and say, that doesn't feel safe. Something feels odd. But maybe you play ball with your dog at home. So your dog goes and sees that activity and then they go towards it. So then what happens, Artem? The dogs start competing over Explosion. the Explosion. Yeah. 
Oh, but your dog is supposed to know that's my dog's ball. Right? Your, your dog should know better. Oh, yeah? How do you know? Because that's my feeling. Because I don't want my dog to get in trouble. Okay, I get that. But they're not getting that because they can only think like dogs. We can't expect them to understand what we want. We can only educate them the way they learn what we want. <laughs> Big difference. So yeah. the other thing, do you ever see dogs that chase leaves, Artem on the walk, or chase bugs, or ch want to yeah. chase squirrels and bunnies? Yeah, they own tail also. Their Everything own, that moves. Their own tail, anything that moves, they go towards it. Towards what's stimulating them. Yeah. How about... And usually, if they, when they already have that idea because of games we play, they, when they get towards the stimulants, they use the mouse. Yeah. Yeah. So then the other things these, these, these games can teach that I've experienced is... How about this, Artem? Charging the front door... Oh, yeah. What stimulates me? Something happening somewhere. Like, in the point B, I'm here, and something, this is point A, something happening in the point B, and whoa, I'm excited to go forward towards the thing that's happening there. And if, and if we go back to what Brandon was saying in, in that video, <clears throat> that short video, was the dog the whole time you're doing these activities, which do not make sense to them because the mouth, the hunt is only related to satisfying hunger. So when they're going to chase an inanimate object, how are they supposed to understand it when it's not natural to their language? The dog the whole time is trying to figure out what sense does this make for me? And some dogs, unfortunately, try to make sense of it. So they go, start <laughs> going after joggers. They start going under, after skateboarders. They start going after kids that are running by because they go towards stimulants. They put things in their mouth. They solve problems by running away from you. And we wonder how this started. And uh, I will also add that they feel confident when they're doing that. Yeah. They feel satisfied. They, they, they feel like, how to say uh, all those hormones, adrenaline, they, they making them feel like I'm, I'm bigger than usual. Yeah. Something like that. Yeah. Bold. Yeah. Yeah. And so they have that emotional, uh, component when I'm doing this, I'm feeling like that. Yeah. And what, one of the things we'll talk about, I like, again, I re went and rewatched the Brandon's video today. And one of the things he talks about that is with Tug. And that's something mm -hmm. we'll talk about. Um, how challenging the owner can then make a dog feel how they can challenge others. Um, so the other thing that's always interesting to me with the throwing the object is how we classically condition our dog to the arousal of our voice. Go get it. Get it. Go. Get it. Go. Go. And then when we actually have a problem and we say, stop, the dog is so used to us saying go that they actually do the opposite of what we said in that moment, which is stop. When we actually need mm -hmm. the dog to not go, they go. Yeah. And classical conditioning, I've said this a million times, is an involuntary response. So when we talk, the dog does it from an involuntary place. It's in them to just do it. Just like hunger. You get hunger. That's not something you can voluntarily control. You're hungry. That's it. Um, and, you know, one of these things I have a, a friend that plays this game with their dog where they make them run up and down the steps. Go, go, go. And the dog runs up and down. doesn't even chase anything. But then that same owner then struggles when the dog is out on the walk when they say don't do that, that the dog gets more intense. So these, <laughs> these things are directly correlated. What, when I play these games, the dog is learning something about me. And it's not always what we intended. So anything else about throwing objects that you wanted to add, Artem? We covered everything that... Yeah. Yeah, we're blowing okay. through this thing today, no, man. No.
Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. We're going to have you in bed by 1030. <laughs> so we're going to move into tug now, which um, is a powerful one. I'm guilty of this. My dog that's sleeping right behind me right now used to do bite work, trained in Mondio ring and uh, IPO and Schutzen and um, everything that her problems were, were I can solve this with my mouth. And that's what Tug is teaching. It's teaching problem solving with ma- mouth. But the thing we have to remember is nature only created the mouth for one thing, and that was to eat. So we have to remember when we're playing Tug, we're also teaching the dog to solve problems with their mouth. And this is when I went back and I rewatched this video, Artem, and I'm going to shut up after this because I'm starting to feel self conscious now. Brandon talks about what Tug teaches. Tug teaches a dog to challenge their leader. So you as the leader, when you say, take this resource and tug on it with me, you're telling the dog to challenge you. And we have to remember, and we're going to go into some of these stories that people use to justify these games. Once we ask the dog to challenge us as the leader, we already lost. We lost the game. Because leaders don't ask for challenge. They have plenty of things to keep themselves busy during the day. If you want to challenge me, go get your own pack. Bye. I don't need challenge. What I need is a cohesive unit to help solve these tasks that I have every day. So when we play tug, it teaches our dogs to challenge us. And what it also means is that other people are weak also. So if I feel, as the dog, insecure, if I feel fearful, if I feel weak, what have I learned from my leader, leader, Artem, to be assertive? Yeah, to put pressure on people. If that, the, that person with whom I live, if he is nobody, like showing me every day that I should not respect him, I can fight him, I can challenge him. So all other people, who are they? Nobody. I can put pressure on them, especially if I'm feeling insecure. Yeah, if I want their seat next to the couch, get off my seat. Yeah. Because we yeah. challenge over resources, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, yeah, it's, yeah, yeah. again, this is only from nature's perspective. So it's not about what we can intellectualize, what Petco is selling us marketing-wise. When I teach my dog to challenge me, it's also setting a message for what other humans are. And this is something I had never heard Brandon say before. It can also be gender-specific. So if your dog has problems with other women and you're the woman that plays tug with your dog, if you're the owner and your dog is aggressive to men, Are you the man in your household playing aggressive games with your dog? It can also be gender specific. And I'm going to have to sit back. I mean, I just heard that about an hour ago and I'm not blind enough to believe everything Brandon says. Like I definitely do my own homework. He's definitely a North star for me to say, huh, that's interesting. Let me go do my own research. So I'm going to sit back in the next couple of days and think about some of these cases that I've dealt with and see when the dogs were struggling with human aggression, if it was more or less and who some of these dogs were having problem. Maybe that was indiscriminatory. I guess that's, did I just make that word up where it was both people, but was there more problems with men and women versus maybe who's playing that game with them? Have you ever heard him say that before? No, no. Yeah. I thought that was really fascinating. Um, And let's talk about resources as the leader. If it's mined, nobody should get it. Yeah. And that's the way nature programs it. Once it's mine, it's for nobody else's. We do not share that. I do not share my alpha female with the rest of the group. We do not do that. Right? It's mine. Until... Yeah. And and, and let me have that idea. It's also uh, easy to check in our... A human's uh, psychology. Try to take away phone of your husband or wife. Just take it and 
hold it with you all day long. No, you will be not able because, <laughs> for example, my wife, if I'll take her phone away, she, no, give it back. <laughs> I have calls. Yeah, I need to chat. I need to watch like serial movie or something. Same with me. Take away that my phone from me. And if if it even will be my wife, the closest member, yeah, the closest human in my life, I will be asking her to give it back. And with the dogs, we think that we just playing when they doing. Yeah, we just playing. Yeah, with that thing that we have. Yeah, absolutely. And some of the other things we're we're teaching our dog is how hard they should be biting. It's oh, yeah. grab yeah, yeah, yeah. with you, yeah. life because we're pulling now. So one of the things about socialization is the dogs are learning from each other bite inhibition. When I bite you and it's too hard, there's a consequence. Either you fight back or you stop playing, which we'll talk about with squeaky toys, how that creates a bigger problem. Um, so we're teaching the dog when we're playing tug how hard also to bite, which is not a good social skill. They're not, talk, they're not learning the sensitivity of their mouth. They're only learning the death grip of their mouth. And the other thing mm -hmm. that's always fascinating, have you ever walked into an owner's home or even maybe a dog that you're watching, Artem, and you take their ball away? Kimberly showed this in uh, – our friend Kimberly showed this in one of her videos where that boxer that she's watching, she took the ball and put it on the table and you just see the dog like this. They don't even yeah, know obsessed. how – They don't even know how to be. That's so unhealthy. It's such an addiction. Their brain can go nowhere else but this thing that means nothing to their real survival of life. So you'll, I've had this happen you know, at daycare where you'll bring a dog in and they don't know what to do because they're like, wait, what, huh? They don't even know how to smell a butt. They don't know what's going on. And then they have these explosions, right? Because that's all they're used to is going towards things that's stimulating, having these intense explosions. They don't know how to self-regulate. Yeah. Anything you want to add? You're looking away. Anything good? No? No, oh, it's, it's, it's okay. Okay. So Just let's, thinking. Uh -huh. yeah. So we're going to go into stuffed animals. Yeah, let's go. So stuffed animals, something very popular, you know, and I think a lot of people used, use stuffed animals when, they, when their dog isn't social. They're, they use the stuffed animal as the dog's friend. Here's your friend, right? You can have a friend. Mm -hmm. The problem is they're killing their friend. They're ripping their friend's <laughs> eyeballs out. They're ripping their friend's stomach out. They're ripping their friend's feet off. They're ripping their friend's tail off. They're trying to eat their friend. They're shaking their friend around, but it's their friend. So then we get... Cannibal friends. Yes, right? Cannibal. <laughs> it's a cannibal, <laughs> right? So um, then we're, we also, in marketing, knows this. This is the sad part that the people... I heard Brandon say this once. The people that created these things knew what they were doing. And that's the sad part. That is the absolute sad part is that somebody actually knew what they were doing and they don't care about us. They don't care about our dogs. They don't. So we have to, just like our, a lot about for ourselves, we have to take our own health into account, right? So if we take a stuffed squirrel and we're throwing that for our dog and then we go walk our dog and then we want to chase squirrels and then we put these collars and contraptions and use all of these mental, you know, or sorry, physical trickery, to stop the dog from having a mental problem, why are we pointing the finger at the dog? We're the ones that created the problem. The dog would have never chased the squirrel if we didn't start throwing the squirrel. Yep. And then we wonder why when we... One, get, uh -huh. No, go. Uh, I buy things for the dogs in one shop and uh, they have big wall of toys and few toys it's actually dogs this size like maybe like pug so it's real dog yeah <laughs> and then we wonder why our right. dog wants to run towards little dogs on leash yeah 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 yeah, yeah. <laughs> 
Right. And you look just like my thing. <laughs> yeah. Right? You look like just like the thing I chase. And be since be Do since, you my thing? Yeah. <laughs> look how nice mom brought my toy out on the walk for me. This is so wonderful. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. Right? How you get get out from my home, yeah? <laughs> yes, exactly. You get sneaky, back. <laughs> you sneaky bastard. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> yeah. Um, you should be home. <laughs> And I always go back to this one client, and this is not an example, and it's one of many. But I went to this friend. I can't remember how I met this person. I met, or I met him. Um, one of my friends, I think, referred me, but I don't remember which friend. I went to this woman's house, and she was having problems with her German Shepherd with leash reactivity. Artem, uh -huh. she lived in a one-bedroom apartment. One bedroom. Uh -huh. The dog had 21 toys on the floor. 21 mm. toys. <laughs> And I pointed to yeah. the hole in the dog's bed that was in her crate. And I said, does your dog chew up their bed? And she's like, oh, my God. I spend a fortune, a fortune on dog beds because my dog chews up her bed constantly. And I looked at her like, with like a puppy head tilt like, do you think your dog knows the difference between a dog bed and a stuffed toy that's out here? And she was like, uh. What she meant to say was, well, they're supposed to, right? Again, my intention was for them to understand the difference between lay on this and kill this. The problem is the dog can't. So in the dog's mind, she's saying, mom's the best. She puts giant, unbelievable stuffed toys in my crate with me before she leaves. It's, yeah. the, it's the same thing. It's got a cover. I rip the stuff out. So what's the difference between that and a stuffed squirrel? There is none. So the dog is supposed to understand your intention, but they can only think like dogs. So if you're going through dog bed after dog bed because your dog destroys it, could it be related to some of the games we're playing? Because it's not a genetic problem. Dogs don't come out wanting to destroy dog beds. Some scratch at beds, right, and, and try to make it fluffy. I get that. But... There's other dogs that are playing with the bed as if it's a toy because they're bored. And it's all they know. It's all they know because they can't just be. They have to always do, 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 do. Um, it doesn't feel comfortable to just be. Um, anything else we want to talk about with stuffed animals? No, no. Okay. Never seen that we get uh, yeah. having that dog. And this is something that uh, again, for me, I always I think about everybody else is going to make a mistake, and I mean this. Um, it's like being a defensive driver. I know you you know the term defensive driver, Artem. I know, okay, so defensive driver means like you're you're assuming that somebody else isn't going to do something, like they're not going to stop at the stop sign. So you're being mm -hmm. defensive. So maybe you stay a little bit longer. You know, when you're going to change into a lane, you're, you're mm -hmm. thinking that maybe somebody else, so you're just a little more cautious, right? So you're being a defensive mm -hmm. driver. I want to think about this. So I'm always preparing my dog that somebody else is, I want them to be defensive dogs. Somebody else is going to screw up. If somebody talks to you like this, back off, <laughs> right? What can you do? What can I do to prepare my dogs for other people to do the wrong thing so that you do the right thing? And this is a huge problem that people run into. Again, it goes into stuffed animals. When people dress up their dogs, their little dogs, with sweatshirts and bow ties and oh. sweaters, right? Mm -hmm. Artem, mm -hmm. there is absolutely nothing wrong with having a chihuahua in the Ukraine that needs a sweater. They are cold. Yeah, yeah. The problem for me comes... If you treat the dog differently because they have the sweater on, that's one problem. The second problem we have to remember is, is that other dog playing with a stuffed animal that looks just like my dog in a sweater? So we could potentially be creating a problem because of something else that somebody else is doing. And there's nothing I can do about that. But I have to understand that that is a potential problem. My little dog has a sweater. My little dog has a threshold of good temperature that's like this big. She's either 
like panting when it's 80 degrees out. I don't know what that is in Celsius. Sorry for my um, lack of conversion there. Maybe like 25 like, Celsius, right? Or yeah, she's yeah. like 60 degrees and it's perfect. That's it. She has like those two temperatures. Anything other than that, she's either <laughs> or she's like freezing. So I put a sweater on her and it seems to make it. But I'm also aware when she socializes with bigger dogs that I'm around dogs that don't play with toys because they could potentially think she's a toy. Yeah. And it's something we just actually ha- never, never thought about it. Never think about it. That clothes, it's, it's the same material and it looks almost the same. And if the dog tried to bite it, it's actually have the same feeling. Oh, <laughs> I should bite you. Yeah. And then what we're going to talk about no- next is squeaky toys. So squeaky the, toys, yeah. So then Let's depending go. on what the animal does when the other dog gets there, could even intensify more the reaction that the dog is feeling towards that stimulant. So squeaky toys, what is the purpose of squeaky toys, Artem? What does it simulate? Oh, okay. Yeah. Uh, it simulates uh, the prey. If, if, if the dog attack real prey, it will squeak also. And there is another squeak that dogs hear when another dog squeaking in communication between two dogs. Yeah. But one means something social, another means something predatory. So what and th- when our dogs play with uh, squeaky toys, and usually it also looks like animals, not always, but looks like animals, it's all about prey drive. It's not about being uh social yeah so what a squeaky toy teaches a dog is to go towards move forward yeah, yeah. bite down on things that make noise yeah and that could be little by dog. the way seeing that regularly in my yard yeah if if some dog coming and uh something happening between two dogs and the one is and that sort of, where is it? I'm coming. Yes. Immediately. Yeah. Which is the opposite, like you're saying, of what nature teaches. When two dogs play and one makes the yelp noise, the other one should be like, yeah. oh, shit. Did I yeah, hurt whoa, you? I'm sorry. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Move away. Yeah. Away from. Not move forward. Somebody who is squeaking. Yeah. One of the worst fights, Teresa and Stop I. Stop using the mouse. Not going. Absolutely. Hard. One of, the the wor- one of the worst fights Teresa and I ever had was when a big dog stepped on a little dog and one dog came flying across the yard, had a muzzle on. Another dog misinterpreted that intensity. Fight. Bang. And it all started because that dog played with toys, heard that little dog squeak, and came flying across the yard. The other dog was like, what the hell are you doing? That's not that. I don't like that. Too much pressure. So then they decided to take care of that. So we have to realize that Squeaky Toys teaches the dogs to bite down on things. They also teach the dog to go forward and to do it until the squeak stops. Right? They try to, which is what nature, and then the squirrel finally stops. They shake and then they decide, oh, you're dead because you stopped squeaking. And if we, when we talked about it last week, how many dogs kill another dog, kill a cat, kill it, and then don't eat it? So yeah. a, you're telling me a predator's going to the trouble to burn energy to kill and then not eat it? That's not natural. Doesn't happen. Does not happen. We don't just walk around killing stuff during hunting season and then just leaving it in the, in the woods. Oh, yeah, I shot that deer, right? The plan is to bring it back and then to eat it. That's the plan. So when we play squeaky toys, we're actually teaching the dog the complete opposite of of what nature intended socialization to be, which is to be sensitive with your mouth, especially when the animal is injured. Ow! Right? The dog, 
And what I thought was funny, when you go through like a lot of positive reinforcement only type of trainers and things, I'm not like saying it's bad or good. I'm just saying it's a very common thing that I see in those in that world is when you have a mouthy puppy, the dog bites you. And then what do they say to do? Ouch. And then move your hands away. Ow, you hurt me. So that's our intention is to teach that. The problem is then we give the dog a squeaky toy, which does the complete opposite of that. So ouch, you're supposed to understand that hurts, but then here's a squeaky toy. Let's redirect the energy into something. How about just don't put your mouth on the leader? Mom teaches that, right? That video, we're going to find that video. It's got like 6 million views, Artem, that one you shared with me. Yeah, it's very popular. Everybody posts it. Everybody's posting. Just... Oh my God. It's, <laughs> it, it, it's when a mom is teaching those dogs, shut up, back off, and she's not using treats. She's not using toys. She's using her intention. She's using her domination and ultimately disciplining. How do I get my puppies to stop doing the things that they're doing? And it's not by tricking them by saying, well, now go forward and do this, right? Stop doing this and then let's redirect into this. No, how about just stop doing it? Yeah. Just stop doing it, especially to me who's supposed to be your leader. So we're going to get off topic there. So I'm going to just stop that. Um, so then we talked about when they play with other animals and they squeak, they move forward. A dog should not move towards the stimulant if it's injured. Not a social creature. We don't need predators anymore. That's what gets dogs killed. That's what gets dogs homeless. That's what gets dogs in the shelter is when dogs go towards stimulants and try to solve the problem with the skills that we accidentally taught them with our best intentions. So um, squeak moves forward. Um, you know, I, I had seen this recently from a trainer where they were giving a dog a toy to teach the dog how to have bite inhibition. And it just did not make sense to me. The only way that could make sense to me is if the dog had like an electrical stimulant in the toy that was based on like mouth pressure. So like if the dog bit down a certain way, it shocked them, right? Then the dog might be able to learn not to bite so hard. But I don't understand how giving a dog an inanimate object that can't fight back teaches them how to use their mouth softer. It just doesn't make sense to me. I mean, I wish, I mean, I might, I might need more clarification. Maybe there's something I'm missing, but something that can't respond, I don't understand how that's making it easier. Um, and then, you know, so um, do, you, do you have anything to add, Artem? I was just going to share my experience with my consultation with Brandon and Kita's history of bite work. I don't know if you had anything to add. Um, we're kind of done the games and analyzing the two behavior, you know, the behaviors that come from it. We 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 done everything. We, we pretty yeah we, yeah we've done the games and we're kind of connecting. Is this related to that? Is my is, is... I, I I just don't want to. Um, how to say? What's that? Forgot about. Excitement. We need to talk about excitement components. So go for it. Let's do that now, and then I'll share my story. All of that activities that we talk about right now, they uh, all of them require the dog to be very excited, and this is uh, what's uh, how to say getting dogs in trouble. Yeah, but they being rewarded for that mm -hmm. while we playing in different time. Like even they when they doing it on their own, playing with the stuffed animal which squeaks, they excited that rip, the the dog is ripping it apart and feel very how to say happy mm -hmm. <laughs> about it. Yeah. So all of those activities uh, have a lot of excitement, a lot of adrenaline. And we actually making our dogs unstoppable, and then we want them stop when they do some uh, things that we don't want to see in them. And again, most of them relate to predatory things. Like there is no problem as leash pulling; it's just your dog connecting to you on that rope and trying to move towards everything. Yeah. So why that dog so excited? Because of those things that many people do. One of the one of the biggest source of uh, too much of excitement. Yeah, uh, we had something in that document about excitement. Yeah, no? we're getting there. 
Can, can, can you read it? I think it was deleted. Oh, okay. Let me just see. Um, okay, it's just... Uh, um, well, I think ultimately what you're saying, Artem, is we teach our dog go, go, go. And then what we yeah, really yeah, yeah, and then yeah, we really yeah. need our dog to stop 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 stop, stop, stop. stop. Yeah, right yeah, so yeah. like stop stop immediately stop yeah, immediately go 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 and stop immediately yeah Just like stop that's all go chase the ball go how chase that can yeah yeah go yeah, chase yeah. the how ball that can go happen. chase yeah. the stick go chase the front door go chase the biker but then when I need you to stop I am expecting you to do that and understand that as my intention for teaching you go, go, go. I'm making you calm by throwing the ball. I'm gonna burn your energy because you're excited by throwing the ball. But when we really want our dog to stop, all they know from us is go, 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 go forward. And then we teach the dog sit, stay. And then we wonder why there's a problem. Yeah, and actually when we see any type of problem behaviors, it's always, some type of emotional state in the dog. Good point. And we want to control that. Physically. But what we're creating, excited, uh, neurotic uh, uh, creature which runs seeing the world through, through these things, from that point of view, always, always on rush, always on adrenaline, looking for something to put pressure on, to compete with, to rip apart, to run after. Yeah. So and then we're trying to control emotions and we creating uh, creatures which one, how to say, not able to control their emotions at all because of us. So we're asking something that they not able to do. Yeah. And if you look at any um, stray dog, they see their world as a predator. Yeah. And they control the excitement uh, <laughs> amazingly well. Yeah. Yeah. So our problem is we're teaching our dogs to see the world as prey. And then we wonder yeah. why they want to be bold towards things when all we do is teach them how to be a predator. But yeah, like I have, I have Bessinger right now. So mm -hmm. he's going after Kane Corso. What's he crazy? What's wrong with him? What's he huh? crazy? <laughs> yeah, he's going after Kane Corso. Like, come on! Like, I'll beat your face. <laughs> My mom told me I can do this. I'm a special snowflake. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Um, we have a lot of questions, and we were going to go back and answer them. I, I promise you at the very end. So if you have them, post them in here. But I just want to keep like going through this. <laughs> Let, let me let me add one thing. Yeah. Uh, I I'm translating it in 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 my head in in English. So I call that Bessinger that he thinks that he's immortal. Mm -hmm. Oh yeah. <laughs> Most a lot of our dogs think that think that they are in, immortal. You know. Yeah, we're teaching them. That's one of the things I had put in the front. Um, we're teaching our dogs to ignore genetics. I have more dogs yes. that bite people who are actually insecure dogs because we're teaching them to be bold. So we're taking a dog who naturally would be insecure and stay away, teaching them to go forward and then wondering why they can't handle the situation because that's not who yeah. they were made to be. Right, the dog that just barked yeah. behind me when the UPS guy came—it's my friend's dog who I'm staying here with. That's her, right? She, her mom before used to do all the things we're talking about because she's explosive, because she's a pit bull, because these are the things that society tells her make her dog happy. The problem is her dog's genetically skittish. Her dog has problems with security. So then when I go out on the walk and I'm not actually supposed to take care of these things, I cause the problem. The reason why she barks right now is she's saying, please, somebody else take care of that. Because I'm not made to, but I can at least be super hypersensitive to let anybody else know shit's going down. Can you come save me? So then my other dog came out of the bathroom like, okay, I'm here. What's up? Right? Which is what, if we think about it, that should be happening in our house. Your dog, when the doorbell rings, can bark two or three times. But if they charge towards it, and especially when you're moving to it, that's when it becomes a problem.
We got dogs. Yeah. We got dogs to alert when things were coming near our campfire. Something's around. Okay, yeah, now shut up because I'm going to take care of it. Okay, cool. Throw you a piece of steak. Now we have dogs that think that they can solve the problem. They can't solve the problem. So I'm, I'm just going to explain this real quick. Um, Go. My, my situation. So I, again, I have a Malinois, went through bite work. I, she is... Um, a, genetically a very secure dog. She doesn't have insecurities. She's not, um, she actually would be, you know, as, um, I co-own her with Michael Ellis. He's, uh, when I worked at the school, I needed a Malinois and he had a four month old puppy and she became mine. So basically, um, he said to me, she would be the perfect personal protection dog because she loves to bite, but isn't looking for a reason to do it. Right. And if you look at most people that train, you know, personal protection dogs, you can't take them anywhere because the dogs are nervous wrecks. They're always looking to fire off at something. She's never looking to cause a problem. She just is like, hey, what's up? Oh, bite that person? Mm -hmm. Sure. <laughs> right? With no, because she enjoys it. She's got good want to bite. She finds satisfaction. But she's not nervous. Are you... Uh, 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 should I, uh, should I, uh, and then you get these dogs. So very few dogs are actually, are actually capable of doing this. And there's only one person in the world that I would ever buy a real personal protection dog for. And they're super expensive. And that's Ivan Balabanov in Florida. He's the only person that I know that's doing it right. Right. And, and most of the other people are just giving you dogs that are in bite suits who've never really had a live bite. And they're taking your money and the dog would never really bite somebody. But they, you know, I can say my dog is a personal protection dog because they bit a bite suit. We're not going to get into that. That's a whole other, you know, thing. But I was having a problem in particular. I'll give you an example. One of the exercises we do with bite work is the dog is in front, the decoy comes out, and the dog learns to manipulate with their voice. So Kita barks and the decoy then <gasps> responds. So her boldness gets rewarded from the prey with movement, with insecurity. And then I come back in and I make you more scared. And then she's like, oh shit, I usually solve this problem with boldness. Wah, 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 wah. And then the person's like, oh my God, you're so strong. And then she's learning, oh, I'm, a, I'm pretty badass. How this bit me in the ass later in life is say I'm sitting in the vet's office and she's in front of me. Just minding our business. The woman walks over to give us our medicine. Artem, what did she do? She barked. <gasps> no, she barked the, at the person. Ah, she barked. Because so woman, woman didn't do anything, but Kita just barked? Because it looked like the same situation. She had a lot of practice. Ah, okay, yes. Yeah, she, yeah, She's yeah, in front of me. Approached. Somebody's approaching. And I'm not sure. So the best thing I can do is go to my learned skill, which is to bark. Then mm -hmm. the person stops and she's rewarded again for the behavior. <laughs> and the cycle continued and continued yeah. and continued. Now, this is before I found Brandon. I was having this problem. So I would have this randomly. She would learn that she could manipulate when she wasn't feeling confident, maybe feeling fearful, maybe feeling insecure like we talked about earlier, how she learned to solve the problem. Luckily, it wasn't with her mouth. It was just barking. So I took, I was trying to track down Brandon. He is, why I love Brandon. There's a great article in like, um, I don't remember what art, um, what magazine it's in, what publication, but if you Google it, some information. But basically they were saying the, the, the best information you can get is from the people that are actually doing the work. It's not the people that are like, giving these talks and doing all of these things. Those are the people that usually aren't doing the, walk, the work, right? Like the people that you want to go learn how to build the biggest building in the world from are actually in, you know, Indonesia right now building that building. They're not doing an interview with Architectural Digest. They're actually doing the work. That's the person you want to go learn from. So it's really hard to get a, a hold of Brandon, like really hard because he's got like 50 dogs and he's doing his thing every single day. And that's what I respect most about him. So finally, I'm like, well, how can I just, how can I get like more information? So I was like, sign up for a consultation. So I signed up for a consultation with him and he, he you know, asked me what was happening. And Kita was, she would never respond, but she was doing the, when she would see cats on the walk. When we happened to move to LA, there was somebody who was feeding stray cats and 
And she'd bump into the back of me mm. while she was walking because she was in another world. So I signed up for the consultation for that. So Brandon said, um, put this muzzle on her because he always starts for the muzzle, not because of, well, partly because of biting, but also because of other experiments he's, he's getting to with how the dog feels about the muzzle um, and how they view their world, how they view that tool, what it does to them psychologically and physically. And I tried to put the muzzle on her. And this is a dog that's had a muzzle on a lot. She's not far into muzzles. She is fine with a muzzle. So I went to put the muzzle on her and she pulled back and she smelled the buckle. And I was like, hey, come here. And I went to put the muzzle on her again and she backed off and she smelled the muzzle again. And I was like, huh. And Brandon sat back in his chair. I'll never forget it. And he goes, that's fascinating. And I went, what? And I, and I went, come here. And I put, went to put the muzzle on and she put it on. And what he said to me was, thousands of dogs have been in that muzzle. The one place she smelled is what I touched. So in her mind, she was trying to figure out who are you and what's your intention, which is what she's always learned with bite work. What is your intention as this human? Are you somebody I should fight with or are you a friend? And that's the problem I caused my dog. Whenever she sees people, instantly, she's trying to assess those two things. Or is this one of the scenarios I've practiced or are you somebody that I've also practiced that I can dominate with affection? So I, I call Keita my 60s love child. She is always looking for free love. She is always looking for free love. She loves everybody and everything. But if she's in a situation that refreshes her mind back to those days, she goes to what she knows because it's safe for her. She's like, oh, shit, I know this. I know how to solve this problem. So that's my personal experience and something I've had to overcome. Luckily, I don't have a dog genetically that is super skittish where she's actually moving forward with the behavior. She's kind of can be stuck with just the vocalizing the because she's so we've done so much training with because it's exhausting. One of the things with bite work and sport work is when you play tug, that's exhausting to the dog. So you can't do a ton of that in the play because it, it's, it slows down your training. If every single time my dog some, does something right, I play tug with them for five seconds, they're getting tired. So that means I can go from a 10 minute training session to a five minute training session. So what we've learned is some dogs you know, you can see it when you go by a dog's house that's barking behind a fence. There is chemicals that are dumped in a dog's brain that make barking reinforcing. They, it produces chemicals and they enjoy just the feeling. So if my dog is healing along, doing a great job, I might release her with a marker word, yes, then call her in front of me, front, and then tell her to bark and she's getting more powerful, and then send her back into a heel. So I'm skipping the tug, still giving her a reward, giving her that dump of chemicals that she needs to continue to do the work. And then I'm wondering why she has that problem. Again, I can't penalize her for that. I'm the one that created that. Am I an asshole, Artem? Can you believe I did that to her? <laughs> <laughs> it's okay because you have no you you didn't have information. Well, I did what I wanted to do at the time, and then when I decided yeah. to change, it was she's taught me a lot about that you know the nervous system about undoing predatory behaviors because she was really good. She was really good, really really good at a, being a working dog. Um, so it's you know undoing some of those skills. Again, partly, part of it is genetic or explosiveness. That's what makes Malinois fun to train. They're super uh, astute to their environment and they're super energetic and their OCD makes them fun. But then when you try to undo these things, it can also make it tricky. So that was just my personal story. Um, just in case there's anybody else out there that's like, well, what do I do now? I've been through it and I live it every single day. Every single day, I'm in an uphill battle to undo those first four years of what I did. So let's go into it. Anything else, Artem, that you wanted to add? We're going to go into some of the health problems and mental things that we... Yeah, yeah. Okay. I actually wanted to say that. Let's go to that part. Yeah. 
So some of the health things, I am not a scientist. I did read a lot of good articles. If you sign up for my newsletter, I will post all of these articles that I read from different experiments about the long-term exposure to adrenaline and the chemicals that are produced um, during these arousing activities that are detrimental to our dog's health. So part of what we're going to talk about just is these big points. If you want to get more scientific nerd, which I am, am learning myself, but I'm not a uh, professional in this, nor is Artem. So we'll give you the professionals and you can diagnose it yourself. So one of the things they talked about was owners cause more stress in their dog than nature actually occurred by the games that we're playing. So when we get our dog so aroused, we're actually creating more of adrenaline, cortisol, and all of these things that have long-term effects on our animals. So for example, the immune system is not working well when uh, adrenaline, a lot of adrenaline in the blood. Yeah. Immune system is not working. Yeah. It's just shutting down. Stomach is not working. Yeah. This is what I remember. Yeah. And a lot of other things are being prioritized because it's not for memory creation and it's for fight or flight. So if you're... Yeah. Everything that works really good is muscles. Yeah. Yeah. A lot of blood in muscles muscles yeah um and these and one of the things that you know when when the animals do create that themselves with hunt there's time for the animal to get rid of those chemicals there's a natural process they get dumped with the chemicals and then over time the body actually relieves these chemicals through a natural process but if we consistently compound it day after day by playing then we're going against hey Come in here. We're going against what the chemicals are actually um, meant to do, which is leave the body and then yeah. making it longer and longer that they're staying in there, which can, in the articles I read, can lead to um, organ problems and mood disorders are two in particular that we, we wonder why our dog has this explosive aggression or a grumpy. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And then mm -hmm. we also can, you know, different organs now function um, improperly because of these actual um, in, in stressful state that the dog is living in. For an anatomy object. Anything else? I'll just go through that okay. list because I don't have it. Yeah. And then for there is not. Perfect. So we see ex can... we see excessive whining and barking, chewing, digging, pacing, pacing, and excessive licking. Those are all things that are also a, a, um, contributed to this increased adrenaline that the dog is facing. They'll start to move around and pace and do want to do more and more and more. Um, the other things that the dogs lose is their social sensitivity. Because they treat other dogs oh, like yeah. toys. I know you have a, a feeling about that. Anything you wanted to add? Yeah. This, the loss of social sensitivity? You know, I just, when you've been talking about squeaky toys, uh, I had that thought. Can, what we actually do. So we bring puppy to our home and that puppy like three months old and in that age, that puppy should be with other puppies and they play and squeak a lot and learn to back off. So then we put in that squeaky toys when he's three months old, no puppies around. He's on quarantine, yeah, mm -hmm. because of vaccines. Quarantine, and he yep. killing that squeaky toys and learning opposite from like that age when actually whole of uh, social skills should be developed by communicating with other puppies yeah. and mother and dogs. Yeah, social sensitivity is something that actually it's hard for me to explain, but especially in English, uh, <laughs> I see that in dogs. <laughs> I just see how they don't know how to. Yeah. It's something that we talked actually a little bit earlier today. So they don't know how to, and they have their own way of thinking and seeing of situation. If you if you squeak, I should attack you. Things like that. Yeah. Some of the and, other. And yeah, and. Uh, what else? No, this is it. Okay, so they'll ch so the other things that we see mentally that become problems are dogs choose a toy over their own kind. So they'd rather play with something that's not alive 
instead yeah. of playing with something that is just like them. So they'll and I will say, not play, be with. Yeah. Not play, because it's not they, they're not playing a game. Yeah. We just call it playing yeah, yeah. games. Yeah. To be with, piece of rubber. <laughs> yeah. This is the best option for the dog, and he's not choosing other dogs. We have, we have this game we play with our friends sometimes where we all put our iPhones or whatever phone if you're one of those weirdos that use an Android, just kidding. Um, but you put all your phones in a pile, and then whoever touches their phone first at dinner has to pay. Right? It's, oh. it's the same thing. I'm here to talk to you, not watch you text somebody else on the Yeah, by phone. the way, phone's doing that thing to same us. Thing, yeah, yeah, right? yeah. No, so, not, not, not a nice example. Yeah. yeah. So um, then also dogs can learn to fight over resources. They get defensive. They learn to be bold. They learn to put pressure. So these are some of the other things that we are seeing, we're putting the connections together. Um, yeah. That, that things that happen. Um, a lot of dogs um, become neurotic and, and, and live in isolation because their owners don't know what to do. So they continue to do what they, you know, what am I supposed to do if I can't throw the toy for your dog? Well, that's kind of like the chicken or the egg. Maybe your dog could also start doing things if you stop throwing the ball. So it goes yeah. back and forth. And one of the things, um, you know, we were talking about before, like, well, my dog loves it. You know, and so does loving a cigarette, but it doesn't make it healthy, right? I, I saw yeah, that somewhere yeah, else. Yeah, I thought that yeah, was a really yeah. good uh, little quote, you know. Um, dogs are learning to be reactive without thinking. They just explode. They learn to be a bold lion and not, and not be thoughtful. And then they run across the street and get hit by a car or attacked by a bigger dog. Also, we'll add to that thing and to uh, social sensitivity. Uh, I've I seen dogs that not using nose, the number one thing for communicate, yeah, to they use mm -hmm. eyes and ears and not using nose with other dogs. Yeah. Yeah. Just yeah, like they don't have nose at all. And, the, and so, so that was some of the mental things we see. Now we're going to get into the physical. I'm going to yeah. start talking faster because we're at almost an hour and 15 minutes, which is fine. Yeah, it's okay. Yeah. Physically. So I asked my vet when I was there recently, and I've talked to other vets about this. And if you just think logically, I just wanted to be able to say that and not be a liar. But if we think logically, most of the biggest problems we have with our dogs, vet bills wise, are caused by us. Mm -hmm. So yeah. dogs jump over things, chasing balls. They are chewing and destroying leashes, which can hurt teeth, which can knock us over, right? All these other problems that we're having. Just generally being over and excited and energetic, and then the dog makes a stupid decision and jumps out a car window when you're when you, when they see a dog walk by, or, or see you know when you're driving by and, and that kind of thing. Um, they're they're biting and chasing people, right? They're actually trying to make sense of the games we're playing. So they're saying, oh, maybe this is it," and then they do it, and then they have the same feeling. The person is, ow, ow, you're biting me. The same thing their toy is doing, making the squeaky sounds. And they go, oh, shit, that's why you wanted me to do this. I got it. Perfect. I finally understood why you wanted me to do this. So now I will continue to chase every single jogger and skateboarder and biker that I see. Um, I've seen lots of dogs um, be just constantly restless. They just can't settle down because they're just always on edge ready to do something. Um, they will compete over resources. We talked about that. Charging at the front door. These are things that the dogs are doing physically. Um, they go towards things that stimulate them instead of saying like, oh, hey, cautious. Hold on, a, hold on a second. Am I even apprehensive about that? Should I be apprehensive about that? So that's the real stay in nature, as Brandon says. Stay away from things I'm apprehensive of. They're pulling and stalking stimulants on the walk. I mean, so many people, when I watch their dog, the dog is crisscrossing, getting in front of them, slowing them down, jumping on them, pulling, barking, right? All of these things, the dog is stimulated by things in the environment and can't get to it. So they're fighting the leash. They're fighting what, what's going on. And things that I, I've experienced, dogs that play a lot and have these problems, diarrhea, their eyes are bright red, their heart rate is constantly increased. That can't be healthy long term. They have dandruff. That's one of the reasons how I um, found the dog food that I had. The woman was wor working with police and the dog's hair was just falling out. The dandruff was just incredible. And part of it's diet, but part of it is these dogs are stressed out. They're stressed out. 
Um, the, all the tension in the muscles, as you mentioned, bloat, right? Let's talk about that. Dogs are excited, energetic, panting, and then we feed them because we don't know, and then the dog gets bloat. I've had dogs that I've seen that have ripped toenails out because they're chasing and playing toys. I've seen dogs break teeth because they're running down, grabbing their tennis ball. Oops, accidentally grabbed a rock also. Now I got a tooth that's sticking out, blood. I've seen dogs become paralyzed because they're jumping in the, in the, into the air to grab a Frisbee and they land on their back. I've seen dogs have excessive wear and tear on their teeth. One of the most destructive things to your dog's teeth is tennis balls because of the glue that's made to keep the fuzz on a tennis ball is super, super destructive to the enamel on your dog's teeth. Don't believe me? Google it. It is tremendously destructive to your dog's teeth. So broken teeth, broken backs, necks. How about any people with dog tour and ACL? right? Tears and MCL. I think they have MCLs, but I know they definitely have ACLs. So the dogs are creating these injuries, all the things that they would not be doing naturally. It's human created, human created. And then we put up GoFundMes and then ask our dog, you know, people to donate so that we can help our dog when we're the one that has created this problem. Don't throw the ball and your dog wouldn't have torn his ACL. Pretty simple, right? All right. Um, this is something that Brandon always sells, sends. Um, people that play toys, if you hand their dog something, instantly, Artem, what do they try to do? Put it in their mouth. So when oh, you, yeah. Right? And then we say, smell my baby. You know, like smell this, <laughs> you know, like do these things. And then the dog's like, huh? And then puts the thing in their mouth, right? We're teaching our dogs to put things in our mouth and it's all from us, right? It's all for us. And then we get fearful Right. And then, you know, affects the owners. How do you see, right? So Artem, when the people play all these games, what do you see that it does to the owner? When the dogs act bold, what it does, what does it do to the owner's confidence in their animals? You mean when owners recognizing that dogs acting bold and it making owner upset like upset what i else? have no control yeah over my animal what else insecure of course insecure insecure like Fe oh fearful uh frustrated fearful angry angry because, oh you're doing that oh stop and i'm i'm not able to stop it yes yeah and um you know th shame because of judgment very good one. Lots of people will not walk their dog yeah. at certain times because of the way people will react. Um, yeah. And um, yeah. Um, so let's just talk about real quick the counters that people say. So these are the things a lot of times I hear Artem that say, this is why I can play the game. If I end the game with the toy, then I won. Mm -hmm. So that makes it okay. And I always say, did you really win? When you ask, like as Brandon says, when you ask the subordinate to challenge you, did you really win, even if you ended up with the toy? Because they had access to the resource. Anything to add? Yeah, there? like between, like, tag is the most, I guess, understandable example. Like, if you even start and stop the game in between when dog did that 300 times, he didn't get that information about you. Of course he is. Yeah. And the, the other thing that's kind of interesting here is that a lot of times people will say, I use it for impulse control. I ask the dog to lay down. I ask the dog to do something. But what always makes me laugh is once I do my impulse control, where does the dog run to get his toy, Artem? Away. Away from me. So I'm teaching the dog impulse control, but then reward him for running away, which is the opposite of what I'm actually trying to teach. I want my dog I'm to- I'm teaching impulse control, but rewarding my dog because he's being impulsive, yeah. <laughs> and, it, and it like, to me, makes me think people don't respect dogs. Dogs can do two things at once. A dog can lay down and still want to go kill something. Yeah. I've watched it every single day in bite work. A dog will hold the line, be thinking down. Nice example. Yeah. And then yeah. run and go bite your leg off. They can do yeah, two things at once. Yeah. And a lot of times we're adding pressure. And that's why in bite work and in obedience, reward placement is so important because we're trying to actually counter 
where the dog anticipates the reward. So a lot of times I'll be down the field getting ready for a send. The dog's going to take off. And instead, I'll walk all the way back down and give a dog in a bite, a bite where he's laying down so that he knows the possibility that it, it, it's not always go away. Sometimes it comes to me. So I'm keeping the dog on his toes with reward placement. Thinking that teaches him impulse control. And in some ways it does, but how about just not do that? And then the dog doesn't need impulse control. Why is your dog running away from me? You don't need impulse control. You don't need it. Dogs that run down the street free don't need impulse control. They learn impulse control from consequences. They run into the street. They have a close encounter. They run up to a stranger. The stranger bops them on the head. They run up to a stranger. They have consequences. And then they learn how to really control their impulses. So I ask for, obedi yep. I ask for obedience first, another very popular one. But to me, as Artem says, Famously, in the famous Artem quote, where is the obedience part of the dog's brain? It does not make sense to them. It's human created. So even if you're asking him to do it, it does not make sense to them. A dog would sit for his own reason. He does not understand why you're asking him to sit. Whether he does it or not, you're searching for power where there is no power because a dog doesn't give a shit when you ask him to sit. He does not put it together with jump on grandma. He does not put those two things mm -hmm. together. Just teach him don't jump on grandma then you don't have to teach them sit. And that starts with how you interact with your dog. Um, anything else there? We only have w one more thing, Artem. Anything else? Go, go. Okay. I want to add something in the end. And that's why I have my Artem's final thoughts. We have that. So um, <laughs> when um, my dog already has a lot of energy, so my dog already has a problem, and then I'm going to use that problem to create the opposite of that problem. So my wife can run, like run. She'll come home from a full day of work, sitting in her office, writing movies and saying, I'm going to go take a six mile run. Okay. I don't know how many kilometers that is, but it's far Artem, right? Like every single day, minimum six miles, right? Is she getting less fit? Is she getting less fit by running every single day, Artem? Now she getting more fit. More fit. So she already yeah. has a skill of being fit, having energy. How is running six miles calming her down? Because you know what? She runs now seven miles and she runs eight miles and she runs 10 miles to get the same amount of tired she did when she first started running to run one mile where I used to run, watch her run and she'd run a mile and then walk a little bit and then run and then walk a little bit. Now, then I could run with her. Now I can't run with her because I'm like, shit, she'll just like, I'm slowing her down. The only one that can run with her is my Malinois because the Malinois built for challenge. She's like 10 miles. Is that all we're doing? Yeah, okay. Right? I mean, like Kita comes home and she's like, now are we walking? So we're not, you, you can't solve a problem the same way you get, you got into it. You're, you have an excited dog. You're not going to calm them down by creating more physical energy. You calm them down by making them fit. And, man, and mental excitement. Mental excitement. It's the brain is the most energy draining organ in the body. It's proven. Google it, right? Just by sitting and breathing, your brain is doing most of the work of your body. So let's use that to drain our dog's energy. Let's make them think, where should I be? How should I behave? Not how much pressure can I put on the world? How much challenge? How much of these different things? So, um, all right, Artem, um, I just wanted to see real quick. Okay, Artem's final thoughts. We're ready for it. So the final thought is... Um, Many people, as I see many people, uh, so, how to say, they believe that dogs need all of that stuff that we call toys and games. But actually, the best way to check if they need it is to look on wild animals or stray dogs. You will never see them doing that, those things. And if... Because uh, when I'm giving that example, for example, on consultations, people say, whoa, whoa, no, you can see puppies, like 
plain talk, yeah, but there is a biological and uh, behavioral reason for that. And they really competing and they teaching how to uh, kill and they learning how to hold and rip apart and all of those things. Uh, if we see that some type of behaviors which will look like as playing toys, all of those behaviors have biological reason, not playful reason, not to have fun reason. So, uh, your dog will be not not will be happy because he have a lot of rubber in his mouth. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And the answer is what they need is to like, to be at least uh, in a good relationship with you. And then maybe you will be able to get that dog with another dogs. And this is where they really can drain their energy, be happy, fulfilled, feel a lot of really good emotions. Uh, this is how they can fulfill prey drive because they have that chase there. Mm -hmm. So the final thought, rubber not making them happy. <laughs> it's opposite. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> It's opposite. Absolutely. Um, it's making them unhappy. Yeah. And, and, and their world's smaller because a lot of the dogs and people that are suffering with these problems, the dogs are living a small life. They can't be as, so, yeah. as social as they need to be. Um, so I'm just going to – do you have a minute for some questions, Artem? No problem at Okay. All. I have um, somebody um, that uh, is probably one of your followers. Um, yeah. They have a dog that used to hunt – from their previous owners and currently they're not doing any games, no hunting, no playing, but the dog reacts on cats a lot. So I wasn't sure if you have any insight. Um, again, like th there isn't one go-to strategy. The purpose of this t dialogue for Artem and I is not to solve individual problems. It's to change the way society is thinking about their animals and what a dog is capable of and to give dogs the best life possible. But I just wanted to, um, ask that question to you, Artem, if you had any insight uh, on something like that. Um, yeah, I want to see that. One of your followers. Um, yeah. Give, give me one second. I want to see who is asking. Okay. Can you read that name? I can't because it's in Russian. Or, it. I mean, it kind of looks like, um, like United States letter or English letters, but I... I um, it looks like B and then a backwards N, then a zero or an O, and then... In okay. Yeah. Uh, send me private message. GM me. This is the answer. Okay. Because I, can, I cannot say that, oh, you need to do this and yeah. everything will be okay. U ultimately, this is what we have to realize. Is it, and this is something that Brandon teaches all the time, is it a genetic problem or is this a learned behavior? If the, yeah, dog, if, yeah. if the dog is has the inability to do it, then we can't ask them to do it. And there's a good chance if they've yeah. learned to hunt, then we can stop it. But there's things that we have to do in the treatment plan to get the dog to believe that you're the one that can stop it. And that comes down to owning resources. So if we're playing tug and we ask the dog to challenge us, then we have a cat. And the dog's saying, well, I'll just challenge you over the cat because I want to kill them. Well, in my world, if I have a cat sitting on my lap and I tell my dog that's mine, then they don't go near the cat because they're like, oh, shit, that's yours. So that's not for me. So I'll just go over here and lay down. In, 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 yeah, sorry. Mm. Do you finish? Yeah. In general, what if, if it is not genetic, that dog should feel as a prey when he see a cat. Yeah. Not as predator. So, Artem, what else do you recommend to people to spend time with their dogs um, besides playing games? And my answer to that usually is everything that you can't do because your dog plays games. Because usually they're saying, I can't do something else. And I, I can't take my dog for a car ride because he barks 
you know, out the window. I can't take my dog to the dog beach because he wants to attack dogs. So that's what I would recommend is start with saying that this could be causing the problem. And now we can go do a lot of other things. Um, I don't know. I mean, there's, it's just endless. Like when I hear that, it just like, it makes me want to bang my head against the wall because it's absolutely endless what you could do with your dog besides throw a tennis ball. Yeah. Off leash time. But again, yeah, we saw things that dog will be not controllable of leash. Yeah, yeah, no, and that starts in the home. Can you control things in the home? It goes back to personal space, and you know, episode four and yeah. Five. By, by the way, by the way, uh, there is only not okay. There is uh, two areas where we communicate with the dogs of leash. One is home, and another. Maybe yeah. when we are outside. So what we teach them in that small area when they off leash, going after things, going after stimulants, not listening to us, be excited about something that happened in there, the door, the ball. So then we're going outside for off leash walk and nothing. Yeah. Good happening because that dog is not listening. So we have a question about should you be able to take your dog's food, your dog's food bowl away? Um, this is something that I think people create more problems than, than are needed. Um, if your dog's eating, like, do you want somebody to take your food away? Like, no. Yeah. Does it mean that yeah. you shouldn't be able to? Yes, I should be able to take my dog's food bowl away. But it's not something I practice. It's not something like I walk yeah. over and take my dog's food away or like put my hand in there. That's like this stuff that nonsense that people bring up. The way I practice that is by doing other things in life, like being able to walk up to my dog and they're like, wait, what's going on while they're eating? Yeah. Then I can take to their back off, right? To back off of things. So I don't practice that with something that they're actually able to eat. But that person asking that question, doing that for what? For practicing what? For well, it's one of your get what? It's one of your biggest fans, Artem. <laughs> Who's that? My mother-in-law. <laughs> <laughs> oh. So I think she's just asking as a general question because she, you know, she she does a lot of research and education, and she's owned dogs a long time. So I think she's just asking like a a general overall question of the things that people do um, that that are the normal things, you know. Um, that, you know, like, yeah, I should be able to take a bone out of my dog's mouth, but also that's not the way dogs do it. Dogs don't walk up and take bones out of other dogs' mouths. They walk up, the dog drops it, and then the other dog takes it. That's different. Yes, so, yes. You know, and it's, dumb, it's about dominance. It's, but it's yeah. not about teaching uh, yeah. Yeah, there's no some kind of no trick like, out, boom, and waiting for reward. Yeah, uh, I guess it's Malik. Yeah, we do take questions, so please. Um, you, uh, yes, somebody was saying, I wrote a question, but you didn't answer it. We already answered your question. Um, and Artem says, I put Artem's Instagram up here again. Um, I don't know if you, if Russian is easier for you, if English, you know, as, um, you know, whatever, but here's Artem's Instagram. Actually, oh, this is so, so annoying with this program. When I do this, it switches us. There's Artem. Um, when I go back. So anyway, so yeah, there's that, um, on a rules creates confusion and consistency. Um, the lady was looking creepy. That's what somebody said about my situation with Keto. That's funny. Um, thank you for saying it's interesting. That's all we're trying to do. Like that's going to be <laughs> Artem. I actually have a Gary's final thoughts today. Um, so nice. I have a Husky burn energy four to five every morning. She loves it. Yeah, I mean, if you have a husky, I'm not saying that they're not made to run. What I'm saying is, in my opinion, Artem, while they're running, what are they thinking? So yeah. my dog runs six to ten miles a day with my wife. But as she's running, she's not thinking predatory things. That's different. So if you And run, also how do they feel while while they're running? What they're thinking about? Yeah. And how do they feel? Bold, like hunting, yes. ready to put pressure on somebody or yeah. Which is just just 
uh, running with another uh, and more dominant park member. Yeah, that's all they're doing. Is Kita is Kita is lucky to be taking this run. That's all. Melissa's not doing it for her. She's doing it for herself. And because Kita does what Melissa needs and reacts the way she's supposed to, she gets to go along. That's why she's there. And also, we live in Los Angeles, and it's good to run with the big dogs because there's creepy people out there sometimes. And it's funny because she's the sweetest dog ever, but people cross the street, man. There's like definitely Malinois racists out there. They mostly think she's a German Shepherd. <laughs> they, they like her, like, oh my God, she's scary. And I'm like, don't tell people she's friendly, Melissa. Just run. Like, you know, don't, like, there's no need for people to know that she's friendly. Like, there's no need. Um, so here's Gary's final thoughts. I know that this is a topic that is very polarizing for people. And one of the biggest problems I feel like in the dog, not for dog owners, which, you know, it's somewhat, but in the professional space, I'm talking to dog trainers, dog walkers, dog daycare owners, people that, you know, really take their dog training seriously. Um, I just want you to look at this. Just be unbiased. Are you right now getting angry, frustrated, revved up? to just defend your perspective? Or can you actually sit back and have an, a no attachment to the things we're talking about? Because I don't care if people throw balls. Good for you. I care when people then blame the dog for the things that the dog has learned while throwing balls. And that comes from being willing to admit that a dog is learning what they need to learn in their world, not what your intention is. So intellectually, it's easy for me to realize, or, or, or it's, it, intellectually, it's, it's easy for me to say, this is my intention. But am I, am I selfless enough to say, that's not what my dog is learning, regardless of my intention, regardless of if it makes them happy? Is it causing my dog a bigger problem? So... If you are a trainer, if you are a dog walker or a dog daycare owner, or a groomer, whatever, and you have a dog that is having behavior problems that are similar to the ones that Artem and I talked about, just do me a favor. Just do me one simple favor. Find out what they do with their dog and you spot the trend. Is every one of those dogs that are having those behavior problems, are their owners playing these games? That's the only way you're going to find the truth. It's not by not asking the question and going by your belief. Well, it can't be. Bullshit. Find out. Ask them. Have you played tug with your dog? Oh, you have. Who plays tug with your dog? Oh, your husband, do you have this problem? Do you have this problem? And we'll be able to get to the root cause of why millions of dogs are dying in the shelter every single day. Because that's what nobody is doing. Nobody's actually saying, how are these problems caused? All they're doing is defending beliefs and defending their feelings. Pit bulls are gray, German shepherds are this. Bullshit. Bullshit. What caused the problem? What is that dog's life every single day? What is that dog's reality? And then we can actually get to the, to the root cause of how we're all being, in my opinion, manipulated to do these things that are actually causing the problems we're having. Because if you go to any shelter, Artem, every single dog that is either going to be euthanized today is, going, is getting euthanized right now or is going to get euthanized this weekend if they don't get adopted is having problems with predatory behavior. That's it. Where are they learning it? That's the piece. And what is it that they're learning? So if you can be unbiased, research your own network of people and find out what they're doing and then you'll get to the bottom of that. Anything you want to add, Artem? No, that's all. All right. All nice. right. That's all the questions. Thank you, homie.
yeah, again, like it's not about my, my belief. It's not about Artem's belief. It's about you getting your own perception. What have you experienced unbiasedly? And you will get to the answer. Anything else? No? Good? All right, homie. No. So this will be on YouTube later today um, with captions. So I have to rewatch this whole hour and 41 minute and, you know, um, change every time Artem says sing to thing. <laughs> It always does that. I'm like, okay. <laughs> but thank you so much, Artem. I appreciate your time. Um, love you, bud, man. I really, I'm really grateful I found you, man. Seriously, like that we linked up. Same, same with me. Because it's, um, you know, I just, uh, it's nice to have somebody that just has dog's best interest to be able to bounce ideas off of. So, and uh, thank you, Angelica, for staying up and um, <laughs> giving Artem the bedroom. <laughs> I'll talk. I'll talk to you soon, bud. Have a great night. Thanks. Thank you, everybody. Ah. Yes, thanks, everybody. Bye. Bye.